real honor and privilege to be here um, and to be part of the Webbit family. And um, we're going to talk about the future of health and medicine here in Bulgaria and here around the world. Um, you know, it's a really exciting time in healthcare. Uh, many technologies are accelerating from robotics to nanotech to artificial intelligence. And it's our potential today to use those technologies in new ways to rethink and reimagine healthcare around the planet. It could be the future of the hospital, which increasingly will not be the hospital, maybe virtual care. It's thinking about healthcare here in Bulgaria, around Europe, around the world, in new insightful ways and bringing new energy and entrepreneurship into that focus as well. But, you know, healthcare is still a little bit stuck compared to some other fields, banking, music, how we communicate. We're still stuck almost in our third industrial age with health and medicine. It still sometimes feels when you go to the doctor like it's back to the future. You know, I trained at Stanford. I did my medical specialty training at Harvard at Mass General Hospital 20 years ago. And I went back to visit Mass General Hospital. And the ward where I spent my first month as a brand new doctor hadn't changed in almost 20 years, except the doctor now had to type the medical record. We used to handwrite the record, and they're still using the cutting edge medical communication tool of our day, still the fax machine. So we have still have a ways to go in changing health and medicine. We're still waiting sometimes months to get their doctor's appointment, and sometimes hours in the waiting room, whether you're here or in San Francisco or Mumbai, the ways we practice medicine have not yet changed dramatically. And we're still practicing medicine in silos, old ways of thinking, old departments, basing our specialization on body parts rather than our genomics and in our connected digital exponential age. So it's our opportunity, all of us, to rethink to, and reimagine health and medicine. Part of that is redefining healthcare from what really it is today, which is sick care. What do I mean by sick care? Our sick care model of today is where we only collect data from ourselves and our patients very intermittently when you're in the clinic, when you're getting your blood pressure, maybe a, an EKG, or uh, you, maybe you're sending your data to your doctor uh, by fax machine or PDF if you have high blood pressure or high blood sugar. And so we have very intermittent and then reactive sick care system. We wait for the patient to come to the emergency room with a heart attack or a stroke, or I'm a cancer doctor, an oncologist. Most patients present with stage three or stage four disease. And it's our opportunity to take these new technologies, and my monitors are out, so I'm gonna look backwards here, um, to be more continuous with our data and then be much more proactive, not waiting for elements to happen. So we can be smarter, more personalized, more proactive, and take care anytime, anywhere, even at lower cost. And that's not just to live forever. Many people are interested in longevity. We want health span. No one wants to be 120 years old and not be able to think, drink, or walk. So we need new ways to extend the quality of life, not just the age. So I want to take you on a quick journey about what we can be doing with health and wellness, optimizing health, the future of diagnosis, picking up disease early, more personalized therapy. It could be an app. It could be a gene editing. And how we can all play a role in discovery. So everyone is getting interested in healthcare. This is the cover of the National Geographic from three months ago in January. Um, I was lucky to write the opening article about the future of medicine. And, it, you know, it's not really about any one technology. It's how they're coming together in new ways and how many technologies are accelerating, right? We all now have supercomputers in our pocket riding an exponential technology. Moore's Law, the power of computing getting faster and cheaper all the time. These are incredible supercomputers that have dramatically changed our lives and medicine. And on these exponential curves, you know, the technologies of 20, 30 years ago have sort of become digitized and, and dissolved. You don't buy a GPS unit or a flashlight or even a, a movie device now. It's all become appified. And that's starting to reshape healthcare as well. And healthcare around the planet. The poorest on the planet, the bottom billion, all have SMS phones. Soon, three billion new people will be coming online, and almost everyone has a smartphone. That can democratize healthcare around the planet. So I want you all to become exponential thinkers, to think how quickly technology is accelerating and to appreciate where technology is heading as we can all use that to reshape health and medicine. So a little framing, how quickly things are moving. It was only 12 years ago, 2007, that the first iPhone launched, that Twitter came out in 2007, that Facebook came out of universities, that Airbnb was basically still a mattress company. So much has happened in just the last 10, 12 years. The next 10, 12 years are gonna make the last 10, year, 10 years look slow. So we all can start to reimagine healthcare. What's possible today is incredible. What we can do in the future is going to be even more interesting if we can connect the dots and align incentives. Now, of course, the smartphone, again, has become a healthcare device, not to just communicate, but even vital signs. The lab on a chip can connect to your phone. 
And on this exponential trend, what used to fit on your desktop computer now fits on my Apple Watch, and my Apple Watch is now becoming an FDA-approved medical device. You can do an EKG on my watch. And this creates this new world of the Internet of not just things, but the Internet of medical things, the Internet of the, the body, soon riding 5G, which is 100 times the speed of 4G. And that gives us incredible potential. Just two months ago in China, the first surgery was done over a 5G network. So we're going to really start to bring healthcare in new ways to new people riding technologies that are exponential like 5G. Now, the challenge with our Internet of Things is that it creates lots of new data. You know, lots of these data points don't communicate. Our medical records, our genomics, our digital exhaust. How do we connect those data points in new ways to be useful? Because data by itself, whether it's your genome or your Fitbit data, is not important unless you can make that actionable information and then communicate that to you and your medical team. So it's not waiting 17 years from discovery to being useful. So technology is part of that solution. But more important often is the incentives. How do we pay for health care or sick care? Where I come from in the in United States, we pay more for advanced disease. We don't practice evidence-based medicine. We practice reimbursement-based medicine. We pay for sick care. We're starting in many countries, including the U.S., to pay for value, for prevention, for keeping us healthy. And we're also trying to bring health care on this incentive outside of the usual clinic and hospital, from the hospital to the home, to our phone, or even inside our body. So all these technologies are coming together in new ways. You can go to your corner pharmacy to get care, or just download an app and talk to a nurse or a doctor, or bring your medicines to you on an Uber. So this brings us to this new age of connected, digital, mobile health. I think we'll, those are buzzwords. We'll soon just call it health. But it does give us the ability now to connect the dots in new ways. And it's not just digital and mobile. It's now 3D printing and AI and synthetic biology and nanotech and virtual reality converging, super converging, that gives us really new ways to reimagine healthcare and to use those technologies at the blend between our clinical needs and technology to create entire new fields, from computational biology to, des to designer drugs to um, artificial intelligence meeting radiology, and to address the challenges we have in almost any country, rising costs, aging populations, challenges with access to care, not enough doctors, nurses, uh, psychiatrists, and beyond, so challenges getting care to folks who need it. We have the challenge of too much data. How do we make that useful information? And then the challenge of who pays and who regulates some of these new tools and technologies. Sometimes we need to pay attention to the basics. We know that our social connections, our social determinants are actually more important than our technology. So paying attention to the basics, right? Clean water, good food, vaccination, our core Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Of course, today in our technological world, we have new needs. Uh, Here's one of them, Wi-Fi, of course, and the basic need for all of us, I think, uh, battery life. So if someone can solve that one. Okay. So we all can reimagine, right? Um, I come from San Francisco, the home of disruption, we think. You know, Uber is an example of an exponential company, only 10 years old, just went public, and they've disrupted the world of driving. They didn't invent new technologies. They connected the dots, new ways of, of using mobile and GPS and online payments. We're even seeing the world of human Uber, Human Uber, developed in Japan, provides a way to attend events remotely using another person's body. It's surprisingly natural. So next time you can come to Webit, send your human Uber, right? And even Uber-type systems can bring you a doctor or a nurse or have your drugs delivered. So we're bringing these user interfaces to help healthcare. Uh, even Uber is getting into healthcare, delivering patients and vaccines in new ways. So what's exciting now is now the big players are coming in, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Alphabet. Even Amazon now is getting into the drug business, pharmacy business, and soon, in many parts of the world, you may have your medical supplies delivered by drone. Now, this is, of course, disruptive to some of the old players. It's disruptive to big pharma. The one-size-fits-all drugs are not going to be there. We're going to be basing it on your personal genome. It's going to be changing many industries, just like Kodak, you know, was used to be the king of photography. You know, they weren't thinking exponentially. They didn't pay attention to the improvements in photography, and they went bankrupt, and Instagram was built by 12 kids down the street from me in Palo Alto, sold for a billion dollars. So we want to be the, disrupt the disruptors, not the disruptees. You want to Uber yourself before you get Kodak as a takeaway. All right. So I get to play a role in this convergence of technology. I've been the chair of medicine at Singularity University since it began. And one of the things we do at Singularity University is look at grand challenges, including in healthcare. And because healthcare is now a team sport, 
bringing many people together to solve problems. I started a program eight years ago called Exponential Medicine. We've grown exponentially. We meet every November at the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego when we bring patients, doctors, nurses, investors, technologists from all sorts of fields together to reimagine healthcare. But part of it isn't reimagination. We also need to get out of our old way. The head of innovation from NHS shared this old quote, the difficulty, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. What are our old ideas that might be holding us back? So hopefully some of you can come join us in November. Lots of great talks and content at exponentialmedicine.com. All right, let's look at three areas quickly. Health and prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. Starting with health and prevention. We all, all want to live long, healthy lives. Our genetics certainly play a role in our risk for disease, but most important are our behaviors, especially our bad behaviors. Not enough sleep, too much stress, smoking, drinking. I'm jet lagged. That's not good for yourself. But in the last decade now, we can start to measure our behaviors. It's only been 10 years since the first Fitbit launched. How many of you are wearing a wearable? I've got like five versions on right now, right? They've exploded everywhere. Um, and many of us don't wear them because they're not yet personalized to us. But this is going to change. These technologies are evolving from sensors in our watches to sensors that can be inside your medications and your pills to track when someone's taken a pill. We're seeing digital patches that can track an intensive care unit level of data. And we can use these in simple ways. Someone who might have had hip surgery or knee surgery, we can tell, are they doing better? Are they walking more? Or are they walking less? And use that to intervene early if they're having problems. So we're moving from this era of quantified self, where we own the data on our phones and it's sort of siloed, to quantified health, where this data will connect with our healthcare systems. And we'll use that to optimize our health, do early diagnosis, and then to monitor and have a feedback loop for our therapy. So let's look at where some things are today that we can do and digitize, right? You can digitize your weight. Now you can also digitize your shape, whether you want to or not. You can uh, me measure your muscle mass, your fat mass, any swelling in your legs, changes in your skin. That could be a new form. Uh, High blood pressure, you can now detect on a watch. This watch squeezes my wrist, detects my blood pressure. There are now radar-based ways that can do blood pressure detection as well. Or um, things in our feet can track a risk for fall. So those are wearables. Then there's insidables, technology shrinking into contact lenses or in chips underneath the skin that can start to measure real-time physiology. So patients with chronic disease may be transmitting their vital signs 24-7 anywhere in the world. So lots of power is coming at this exponential miniaturization. Or trainables, right? Many of us don't have good uh, posture. You can put a little sensor on your back called the upright, uh, developed by entrepreneurs in Israel. You put it on your back, it's like your digital mother. It monitors if you're hunched over or not. And if your posture isn't good for a few seconds, it gives you a little buzz. It's like your digital mom says, stand up straight. That can help your posture as a trainable. Some of us need more help. We need a, a shockable. That will keep you going. Hearables can play music, but also track your heart rate and your steps. Ringables, Fitbits on your finger can track your sleep. Sleep is something we're not getting a lot of here at Webit, but it's so important to your long-term health. Shockable, sockables to track the health of a diabetic foot, for example. Um, or even underwearables, my new favorite, right? These Internet of Thing technologies are getting so small, I'm, I won't show you mine, but here's an example. You put these in your underwear, you get 10 of them. You can put them through the laundry. They'll last more than a year. And it monitors your breathing, your respiratory rate. And it's starting to connect with payments in the United States so we can pay for monitoring uh, patients with lung disease. So we're starting to see these things come together. The most important drug, of course, is our food. Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. So you can start to monitor your food, measure the calories, so you measure your input, and you can start to measure your output. Lots of data there that could be useful. And where this comes together is we can start to personalize our diets. It's not one size fits all. Diets based on our, our genome or microbiome and other data. We can measure the health of the pregnant mother and the baby when they're born using a simple camera and now artificial intelligence. You can pick up heart rate, respiratory rate. So we're entering a time when even Wi-Fi can pick up our vital signs seamlessly. So what that means is we're entering a time where we're going to be having our digital exhaust from our bodies collected 24-7. What do we do with that? It's a so what unless it makes sense. How do you communicate that to your doctor? Your doctor may be overwhelmed with data. We need to integrate that into the workflow of the doctor, the nurse. Tremendous challenges and opportunities to make sense of that. So now we're seeing this real-time data, and companies like Verily and Stanford are coming together with a 10,000 patient trial called Baseline. P people donating their digital exhaust so we understand what that means. So we can be predictive and find out when someone's going to get into trouble. Just like our modern cars have maybe three or 400 uh, sensors, you don't care about any one sensor. You care about when your check engine light goes on. So increasingly, we'll have our own personal check engine light that hopefully brings us care before we even know we might need it. 
Okay, so we've got this data. We know we're supposed to exercise more, eat less. But behavior change is hard. Maybe we need a personal coach. Our personal coach may be an AI avatar that feels real. We're seeing this blending of, of augmented and virtual reality to give us coaching. Um, we're seeing the ability now to use voice as a uh, way to communicate. Voice can be used by anybody. Someone elderly doesn't need to have an app. They can just talk. Amazon Alexa, help, I've fallen, I can't get up. Uh, Alexa, order me my medications. We can use coaching in the mirror. We might see ourselves in the mirror of today, or you might see yourself in the future. If you're smoking and you can see yourself today, and then 10 years later after smoking, that might change your behavior. Or if you spend too much time on Facebook, that could be a challenge. Changing our behavior by seeing our future. So this is an example of new technologies coming together, augmented reality. Things like Google Glass, which are already antique, right? These weren't, great, these weren't a great consumer hit, but they have lots of healthcare applications. And we're seeing augmented reality come into the clinic in very exciting ways. So doctors, nurses, patients can see information and manipulate it in the operating room in real time to give us safer, better, less expensive therapies. Uh, new ways to see through the body uh, to, again, improve interventions. We can even use this to understand our own physiology. Uh, children today can learn about their basic medicine. My, my son, Leo, at three years old, knows his basic anatomy. That can help him be long, live a longer and healthier life. And now these can be used for maybe behavior change. Um, I, I was a pilot. I spent time in the Air Force. When we fly in fighter jets, we have heads-up display. We can see where the fighter pilot is in the other airplane. We can see where the bad guy is. If we're about to hit a mountain, it might talk to us. Pull up. Tell us to pull up. That'll wake you up. What if we use that for behavior change? You have your breakfast, you see it in one way. With your augmented reality, you see it in a new way. And then you get a little hint. Cool. Ah. Tells you to change your behavior. So lots of ways we're going to use these, including virtual reality. It's great for playing games, bringing grandma on a, um, a ride. But we can use virtual reality for treating patients with burn injuries. They go into cold environments. Or for physical therapy. Or for patients who are stuck in a hospital and they're, cold, and they're scared or they're stressed. They can be at the beach in the virtual reality. Or, as our friend Shafi Ahmed has pioneered, using this in the operating room. Instead of having, here's Shafi, you met him yesterday and today, incredible pioneer, using virtual reality to live stream VR to thousands of patients. I was in the operating room within three years, the very first time they did this, to 5,000 medical students around the world. So we can really start to democratize medical education using these tools going forward and bring your doctor to simulate training in any sort of environment. So it's exciting times. And eventually, we'll start to build a ways for surgeons to give them guidance through the procedures. Just like we have driver assist, we'll start to have surgeon assist and doctor assist. Uh, and that will, I think, change the game and bring together robotics and surgeons and doctors in new ways. Okay, what else can we do? The world of diagnosis. We want to pick up disease early rather than late. We now have all these new digital tools for doing diagnosis. Um, it could be a new stethoscope like I have, like the echo stethoscope. You can listen to your heart sounds at home, also do an EKG, and it can diagnose a heart murmur better than a highly trained cardiologist. Or you can now buy an ultrasound device that you can have in your pocket at home, or it can bring health care and diagnosis almost anywhere on the planet. Or do an EKG on your phone to do a diagnosis or manage heart disease. So incredible new ways we can bring diagnostics anywhere, anytime, including, you know, the laboratory. You don't have to have blood drawn today. You can put on this little device and draw us the blood. You drop it in the mail. Or increasingly, there are devices that you can use at home to do laboratory directly on your smartphone. So we can bring laboratories almost anywhere, anytime. Even the idea of a medical selfie. Instead of having to go to the clinic uh, to dip your urine and send it to the lab, you can use the power of our smartphone camera today to if someone has symptoms of a urinary tract infection, you simply take a picture with your smartphone, it does the analysis, sends it to your doctor, you pick up the prescription, or it's delivered to you at home. So new smart ways to make the, the smartphone a camera. What about genomics? We're in the era of low-cost genomics, lowering to the almost a th less than 1,000 US dollars per genome. We can use that in smart ways to, for example, pick the right drug and the right dose. Or I can even have socks made. These are very personal socks made exactly based on my genome. Um, or we can use information from our microbiome, the bugs that are on our skin, in our gut, play an incredibly important role in health and obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, even neurologic disorders. And we're starting to even maybe even do microbiome transplants to improve our gut health. All right, so we have all this new data. How do we collect the dots? How does a doctor today make sense of all this new information? We need help. Artificial intelligence, AI, 
I like to refer to it as IA, intelligence augmentation, is going to play a role across healthcare. It already is. An AI that can look at your skin lesion and diagnose a mole, or help a radiologist interpret an X-ray or CT scan, or digital pathology is here with artificial intelligence, or ways to take a picture of your eyeball and do retinal imaging through DeepMind. And this can bring diagnostics anywhere on the planet with a simple smartphone. So this is not going to replace the doctor or the nurse. It's going to hopefully improve our care. It's not going to be one versus the other. Hopefully, it won't be AI replacing the doctor, but a doctor using AI will replace the doctors who don't. Okay, let's end with therapy. Lots of things happening in therapy. 3D printing is something getting exponentially better, from 3D printing prosthetics to medical devices, uh, maybe even printing devices in the operating room or building your own orthopedic devices. How else can we apply 3D printing? Well, I've been looking at that problem. I treat many patients. I take lots of pills. What if instead of taking lots of pills and tracking it in that technology, you could 3D print your own pill, a pill that was based on you, adapted to you, based on your genetics, that might change day to day and would, instead of taking five pills, take one. Oh, sound effects. So um, I see a future where we're going to 3D print our pills and modify them. You can watch my TED Talk for more details. Okay. Virtual, virtual care is here, talking to chatbots, prescribing digiceuticals. All these technologies are moving quickly, and I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip a couple of them. But these are available today. You can start to use them. Go to digital.health to find some more examples. I'm going to close with the idea of discovery. We can all play a role in contributing to healthcare. We can download a clinical trial and be part of a clinical trial from anywhere in the world. And I think the future of medicine will be crowdsourced. Just like we've changed our driving, we don't use paper maps anymore. We use crowdsourced Google Maps or Waze. Imagine we could build a Waze for healthcare. We're all donating our data and getting information back about our own healthcare journeys. I think if we do that, we cannot just be organ donors or blood donors, but think about ourselves as data donors and leverage this convergence of all these amazing exponential technologies in new ways to rethink healthcare. So I encourage you to all be thinking exponentially. Don't think about 2019. Think about where the skate, where the puck is going to go in 2020, 2029. It's going to be an incredible new world. We all have the potential to use these technologies in new ways to take not linear steps, but exponential ones. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. It's our opportunity to build that future, not to predict it, but to create it together. And nowhere better than the Webbit community and all the innovation in this room and around the world to help bring us that brighter future of health and medicine. Thanks for your time and attention.